So there is no better way than for us to kick off our webinar series for 2018 than with a guest presentation from one of our business partners, Harris Geospatial Solutions. So today's topic is advanced geoanalytics for smarter city planning. Machine learning is the hot topic at the moment. And today we'll take a closer look at how organizations have been leveraging geoanalytic capabilities to make more informed decisions. So it's gonna be a really interesting topic today. Now, before I do get started, just a reminder, we are recording today's session, um, and, but also we have allocated plenty of time for Q&A at the end of the call. So if you do have questions, please do at any time, type your question in the, the side panel um, and then send those through. And at the end of the session, we'll, we'll make sure that we, we cover those off. But for now, I'd like to introduce our guest presenter. So we are really fortunate to have Sheree Malay from Harris Geospatial Solutions with us today. So I know that many of you know Sheree very well, but a little background. So Sheree joined Harris in 2003 and has had various roles across the organisation in both technical and business focus. But currently, she is Asia Pacific Regional Manager, which makes her responsible of all areas of the Harris Geospatial business for our region. Sheree has an extensive background in remote sensing, having worked as a research assistant for the University of Alaska Fairbanks Institute for Arctic Biology, where she studied the relationships between Arctic biology and climate change using remote sensing and GIS. She was also a member of the NASA Land Cover and Land Use Change Program, studying vegetation migration on the Stewart Peninsula in Alaska. Sheree holds a bachelor's degree in biology from Middlebury College and a master's degree in biology from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Pretty impressive. Now, usually, Sheree's dialing in from her home in Colorado, but this week, we're lucky to have her with us in Australia. So now I can literally hand over the reins to Sheree. So thanks. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you everyone for joining us for today's session. I'm Sheree Mulet, and I'm really happy to be here in person in the Esri Australia office to help explain to you what we're doing with machine learning for enterprise analytics and how we're really taking advantage of the different technologies that we have to be able to bring a lot more smart city planning solutions and different sorts of ways that we can help solve these types of problems. Now, many of you will see so many different ways that machine learning and deep learning are affecting different aspects of our lives. We see it in so many different capabilities from online usage, medicine, biology, media, entertainment, security and defense, and many more. And nowhere really does deep learning promise to be even more revolutionary than really in the field of remote sensing and image science. Now, working with imagery and working with geospatial data and deep learning, that really requires a lot of specialized knowledge and some nuances of really knowing how to handle and work with these particular types of data. And there's many different things that we really bring to focus on doing deep learning on these data sets that are important to emphasize for our clients. One is really that we can work across all these different modalities of data. So we can work with panchromatic data, multispectral, hyperspectral, SAR, LIDAR, time series data. And what we can do is really start doing this type of multimodal data fusion and do deep learning across these different modalities. We've been working with data in these various types for decades, and we really have that expertise to do machine learning and say, perhaps we wanna do machine learning on optical data, but then if we can add in an elevation data set, such as SAR data or LIDAR data, now all of a sudden we can start discriminating features based on height and elevation, then we can get even more accurate results as well. Also the ability to work in a data independent fashion, and this is one of the beauties of working in remote sensing and our approach with deep learning, that we can actually do some of the training on, for example, aerial data and take those classifiers and apply it to other modalities of data as well. And that really gives you the power to start looking at machine learning across all these different modalities of data and take into account our years of expertise to be able to automate these types of processes for you. And really giving those um, data fusion topics some focus here is if we use different data sources such as our LIDAR data sets and add that into optical data, 
here's where, for example, we can really start discriminating features. And if we were looking for buildings, for example, and we want to do machine learning on those footprints for various types of needs, we can start now focusing on perhaps specific building heights and discriminate those types of features and fine tune the types of things we're really starting to look for. Or beyond even building height, what if we wanted to understand some more capabilities about the eaves of the roofs and different elevation or aspects here? And one example of that data fusion of machine learning could be understanding the roofs for solar panel placement, for example. So there's many different ways that we can take advantage of using different modalities of data to be able to start fine tuning our methods to be able to really discriminate features in even better fashion. Now we have years of really looking at implementing these solutions and we've been doing a lot of research on our own side for machine learning for a number of years now. What we've been focusing on is a single feature object classification moving into land cover classification and then moving into what we call really a scene state detection and learning what can we tell now what's happening on the ground. For some automated object recognitions, we've been obtaining over 95% accuracy for these types of feature detections, as you can see here with aircraft. And we're really using our expertise in large data and working across all these different modalities of data to be able to start really developing advanced classifiers for doing various types of object recognitions. Here's an example where we're sticking with this theme of aircraft. This has been a common request from a lot of clients. And if we think about this type of approach, we call this, for example, a 2D overhead approach. We're looking for this particular type of object in this, in this capacity, and we're looking from an overhead perspective. And we're able to do this type of detection very well now. We've developed these types of classifiers. And in this particular example, we're using a panchromatic image for aircraft detection. And we can detect all the craft here. And here we show one false positive. And in that case, we'd like to be able to make sure that we can show that false positive and error on that side as opposed to missing a detection in that particular case. And you can see that between standard approaches, we can, comparing that between that and machine learning, we can really achieve a much higher accuracy by using a machine learning method as opposed to a pixel by pixel based approach that we use in traditional methods. When we talk with a lot of our clients and we pull our customers and we say, you know, as an industry and as vendors, we're trying to understand how to do machine learning. What is one of the biggest challenges that we face as, as our customers looking to understand machine learning? And inevitably, the answer is always related to the burden of labeled data. How do we generate the proper information, the proper labeled data to know what it is that we're trying to find and getting sufficient records of what it is that we're not trying to find? so that we can then generate the appropriate accurate classifiers to find everything we need to find within the scene. And one way that we've taken a unique approach to this is with the use of synthetic training data. We partner with some of the labs in the United States and they help us with some of the imagery components. And what we can do is actually use CAD models. So if we stick with this approach of using an aircraft, what we can actually do is take that CAD model and take that object and place it in the imagery in the scenes at various geometries to help create the training data. So you can see if we take that object and place it in the different illuminations, different angles, and different shadowing effects, we can then simulate those different scenes that we need to obtain for training data to make sure that we're capturing all those examples of what would be classified properly and correctly as an aircraft. We can then do that again to make sure we're capturing what is not the aircraft. And using this, we can make a very successful detector for producing these particular types of aircraft shown here in the Iconos imagery. And here is where you can show that heat map of all the detections for the particular type of classifier that we can have here. So here's this, a brief case study about another type of 2D overhead approach and another feature that we'd like to extract. And this is related to crosswalks. This has been another commonly requested feature from a lot of clients because from here we can start understanding patterns of movement and patterns of demographics and people, and really starting to look at what's happening within our cities. So here's an example where we're looking at crosswalks related to pedestrian accidents in Washington, DC. Within our imagery, we identified two different types of painted crosswalks in this example. On the left is a white zebra striped crosswalk. And on the right is really that um, more simplistic, not really painted non-zebra type of um, intersection crossing there. 
And what we did is we used our machine learning to find all of the zebra painted cross rocks, and we displayed them here within ArcGIS Insights. So within the orange buffer areas, you can see all of the individual zebra crosswalks that have been found using our machine learning. And this is showing a subset of the data here, but we actually did this for a much larger scene. And what we did then too is add the data showing the car and pedestrian accidents. And those are shown in the dark circle of the data there. And again, the orange areas are showing the buffers of the zebra painted crosswalks. So now we can start taking a look and saying, okay, we have these different data sets here. What can we do to start gaining some additional insights and areas of focus for what we want to do with these particular crosswalks? So we can see in this intersection here, there have been a lot of the car and pedestrian incidents, but it's also not one of the zebra painted crosswalks in this particular location. So now we can start seeing that even though this is just one intersection away from others, it's much more dangerous location here without having that zebra paint for pedestrians to cross. So we can start using this type of information and automated detections to start looking for patterns, trends, and really start making some predictions about what we can do to help with city planning and understand where these interactions may be occurring and what can we do to start getting ahead of that and in front of that so that we can make these decisions ahead of time and help us with all of our planning. The next area where we really are looking at to go with machine learning now is beyond just that 2D overhead initial object detection. We can do that individual object detection. We've been doing that for a number of different types of classifiers. The next area that we're looking to go is really getting into that target subclassification level now. Here within this scene that I have expanded here, you can see there's a number of different types of vehicles here. But if we want to get into that subclassification of looking, for example, at red cars versus red taxis? What if we want to be able to discriminate that type of feature even more finely to get even more accurate results? So this is that next area of analysis that we're actively working on now to be able to really enhance the machine learning and obtain even more accurate classifiers for even this level of target subclassification. Now there are many different types of deep learning geospatial applications. And on the left are just some examples of different objects that we've been able to identify with machine learning and to really start making these classifiers for those particular features. For example, airplanes, dams, highways, power plants, storage tanks, wind turbines, or rail assets. These are all a number of different features that clients want to be able to detect with machine learning. But what we really want to go, though, is beyond just detecting those particular objects, but what is the condition of those? What can we learn about those different detections? For example, we might understand what the utility infrastructure asset is like, and what can we learn from that? Some of the graphics on the right show some methods where we can do those detections for utility infrastructure and start really identifying each of the individual pieces, by using LIDAR data and optical data, we can start putting some heat maps together of the different usage capabilities, the different materials that are being used, and how can we automatically identify all these different types of features or materials or states of condition. It's getting into is what we call the scene condition. condition, condition, condition. We can do that detection of the feature. We can understand the environment and want to understand the assessment of what's happening. But how do we take that and really move into the scene and start learning about what's happening on the ground and what's actually happening within the environment? Here's an example using road conditions. And what we do here is we obtain data from traffic camera videos and do the machine learning on those feeds to understand is the road wet? Is the road dry? Is there snow or ice present? Is there flooding? And this data is automatically input into various road monitoring systems and weather systems. And this is in use operationally today. So now all of a sudden we can do some real time ground weather analysis of road conditions using machine learning and really start understanding what's happening on the ground. When we combine this now with weather forecasting data and data for what's actually happening on the ground, instead of just identifying what the condition is or what that object is, now we can get ahead of that and start actually making decisions based on that. If there's automatic detection of flooding, is there going to be a flood danger? Should we evacuate employees based on those 
particular locations? How do we alert them ahead of time so that perhaps routing needs to be done differently or other decisions need to be made? And this is what's actively happening now. And here's an excellent example of how we're actually able to take machine learning, bring that into a real world example of how we're learning about road conditions and making decisions based upon that for a number of our clients. Here's an example really now of how we're also taking that information and using car sensors. We can actually take that information, do the machine learning on it, and start looking at the different road conditions. Here's the message. Poor road conditions. Helios has detected snow on the roads and poor visibility ahead. Please drive with car. And by getting that type of alert and by having that type of information fed back into the system, we can start getting ahead and understanding what sort of conditions are there are and what sort of information that needs to be fed back into road monitoring systems. And here's where we start partnering with our colleagues to be able to look at autonomous vehicles. And by having the sensors and the cameras on the vehicles to be able to do these types of uh, detections for us, here's where we take advantage of using machine learning to be able to really help our customers in real time understand what's happening on the ground and doing machine learning based on that in that way. Next case study that I'd like to highlight for you includes looking at wind turbines and blade inspection. And this is a case study of a product that we had developed in conjunction with Edge Data. And this is in the United States. And they want to understand which wind turbines need repair in this wind farm. If we're just looking at data and trying to do this type of analysis, it would be nearly impossible to be able to tell uh, with the naked eye, of course, but then it'd be very time consuming to have analysts go into the field, try to understand where that damage is occurring. And there's many ways that we can assist with doing this using machine learning. And these degraded wind turbine blades are gonna be inefficient and costly. They'll need maintenance, but having people go out in the field is gonna be time consuming and can be dangerous as well. So what we're able to do now is partner with them and bring our deep learning to the wind turbine inspection. They've been using a number of different types of unmanned aerial systems or UASs and really use that data to be able to now scan the blades and let's start learning what we can with our technology about what we can acquire using this type of remotely sensed data. This also helps mitigate any risk of employees climbing the turbines and trying to understand what's happening on the ground. And by using this type of method, the inspection times are going to be greatly reduced as well. And here's the overall workflow about what we are able to do to help build this solution for the company. By capturing their drone data, we're able to analyze thousands of all of their raw images. And here's where we take advantage of using our deep machine learning to be able to start doing that analysis across the blades. What we want to do is find the damage that's been done and then categorize it because there's many different types of damage, and depending on the type of damage, it may take a different route for what needs to be done, whether it's gonna be from lightning, as opposed to dirt or paint chips or damage from bird strike. Some of those will require repair, some of them not yet, some may just need to require monitoring. But depending on then what we can provide for that assessment, the company can then prioritize repair needs and budget, and then we can monitor that over time. And here we're able to take our solution and repeatedly apply the correct damage assessment to accuracies of greater than 95%. So let's take a closer look at Blade Edge's dashboard. So here's the solution that we've been able to build for the company. And you can see the wind turbine blade with the thousands of images that have been scanned and referenced here so that our machine learning technology can go through and start looking at these different ones. We can mosaic those images and here we've built the quality assessment tool so that they can start taking a look at some of these individual features. Here's again a closer look at being able to see some of the different components of the different blades. And then when there's an area of particular damage, you can see that's been highlighted here in the red box. And this is the an area that may be categorized as a particular type of damage that we can present to them and understand what needs to be done based upon that. Again, here are some additional graphics about showing some particular types of um, either strikes or damages that have occurred at the tip of this particular blade. And we can see how it's been listed, the coordinates and location of where that particular damage has been occurring. 
And this is where we can take advantage of the machine learning and have this be done automatically, present to them the different locations of these particular areas of damage, and really make that workflow a lot more efficient. By introducing all these types of efficiencies, we can really start making the clients and the different companies have the capabilities to be able to make some better decisions. And whether it's working at pedestrian crosswalks or different types of turbines and also autonomous driving, we have many different ways that can be taken into account for some greater planning, greater efficiencies, and really start bringing machine learning to a wide variety of our clients. In this final look, you can see here some of the mosaic data and showing some of the smaller defects that we're able to find as well. This is an example that we can find all these different types of defects and really pose us to them and they can see different areas that will need monitoring in the future. So thank you very much for staying with us to watch this presentation on what we're doing with machine learning and many different ways that we can apply this to many different types of solutions for all of our customers. We have some time and I'll turn it back over to Laura and she's gonna take a look at what questions have come in. Thanks, Cherie. So we have had a couple of questions come through, um, but if you've been there you know, watching Cherie and watching the presentation, then you may not have had a chance to add your questions. So there's still time um, if you type your question in um, the question panel um, on the side of the GoToWebinar view. Uh, but I will um, go on to the first question that we've got coming through. So it's a question from John and he asks, is Geiger mode LIDAR available in Australia? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, yes, because the, some of the LIDAR scenes I had shown and some of the solutions that we've been working with are using that higher density LIDAR capability that we have. So yes, this is done out of our offices uh, in the United States and we do have capabilities for uh, requests for large collects to be able to take a look at that. And so we'd be happy to talk about that um, you know, in more detail. So please, we'll get in touch and uh, can reach out to me and Ezra Australia and we can help um, look at some solutions for you. Cool, okay. And there's another question here. Um, this one's in from Stuart. Um, and he's asking, and it's about the wind detection, the, sorry, the turbine detection, which was really interesting. So Stuart asked, does NV, is it able to do the wind turbine defect detection? So NV itself. Yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you. So with that, that was actually using a solution that we had built custom for the, the client there. And that wasn't using NV itself, but that was using our machine learning technology. And we built that into a separate dashboard for the client. And that's something that they have as a solution now. So we can help put you in touch with um, what that type of solution is, or if you have particular types of solutions that you're interested in having a custom built tool for as well, then we can certainly take a look at that. Okay, we've got um, another question that's come in. Um, are you aware of machine learning solutions used for pipe defect and leak detection um, above or below ground? Well, depending on the type of material that we're looking for, um, there's many different types of defects that we can do. You know, what's interesting is that the corollary to a lot of the wind turbine work that we've done is looking then at applications across other types of metal objects and metal detection. So another type of application that has come up is actually looking at large sheet metal when sheet um, for sides of building ships and looking at rust locations. So that's another type of example, um, particularly you know, above ground, I would say that has come up for wanting to understand what other sorts of detections we can do aside from just the wind turbines on metal. Um, that's great. And um, thanks, Alexis, for uh, the comment. I'm glad you enjoyed the webinar. That's good. So for me, is everything that we've shown today available now? Is it something that, um, that anyone who's on the line or listening to the recording can get their hands on or sort of what's the best next step for everybody if they're really interested to know more? There's a couple answers to that. So with our machine learning technology, there are some methods that are available within NV right now. So within our core image processing software, if you want to differentiate between, for example, um, shallow, deep le shallow learning versus a deep neural network, there are two different methods within Envy to be able to do a more basic type of machine learning. And that's with our softmax algorithm and we have the support vector machines within Envy. So that's a way to get started with looking at machine learning already out of the box. 
but then we want to take a look at some of these deep learning applications and or a custom built type of tool, then that's something that we would definitely help you out with and have the capability to do either here in conjunction with Esri Australia and also help bring in our technology and our expertise from Harris to be able to help out with that for sure. Thanks, Cherie. And you can um, um, reach out um, to Cherie um, or directly through um, through us. So on the Esri Australia website, we do have a dedicated page for Harris technology. So you, um, if you go there, you'll find lots of the latest information um, up on there as well. Uh, but we have come to um, the end of today. So thanks everybody for um, really good questions. And thanks to Cherie um, for being here this week and being able to make time to do um, the webinar today. It's been really good. Um, so um, what's coming up next? So in a couple of weeks, we'll be back to our usual time. So um, on Thursday, the 8th of March, um, do join us um, to have a look at, um, what's actually be the first look at SmarterWorks 2.0. So this release of SmarterWorks includes some significant enhancements in how we can um, integrate with GIS workflows. So definitely one not to miss. Um, so I'll be joined by Gary Johnson, who's our, the head of our innovation team. Uh, and we'll also have Hilary Chapman from Planeta joining us. Um, but as always, please do let us know what you think. Um, there's a, as, as always, there's a survey, so please join us um, and let us know what you think. Um, but also you can just reach out to us at any time um, through events at esriaustralia.com.au. Um, and just as a reminder, we did record today's session and we will be sending out a link to you all early next week. So you can rewatch it or maybe share it with a colleague. Um, and also you can find any of our previous webinars um, up on the our Esri Australia events page. Um, but for now, thanks again, Sheree. Thank you very much, Laura. Thanks for having me here. Um, and I'll see everybody um, for the next directions live online. Thanks.